Hi, this is Dr. MJ coming to you from beautiful Boston, Massachusetts. This is the Women in Dentistry podcast where we feature women in dentistry making waves and leading the industry through the next decade. I am your host, Dr. Mary Jane Hanlon, a former dental assistant, dental hygienist, and now dentist. I am pleased to introduce you today to Dr. Maria Moranga. Dr. Moranga received her DDS degree and then her endodontic specialty certificate from NYU. She has served as a consultant to the VA, is an attending to four GPR residency programs, post-grad endodontic program, and is on the dental faculty of NYU Stony Brook and on the medical staff of NYU Langone. She's the past president of the Suffolk County Dental Society and the current president of the New York State Endodontic Association. She has also completed a three-year term as a board of trustee on the National AAE and chair of the ADA Council on Membership. She's also a graduate of the ADA's Diversity Institute and then served a three-year term as their consultant. Additionally, she is the academic affairs director of AAWD. Most notably, she is the co-founder of the double award-winning Scrubs and Stilettos, a woman's yearly CE networking event. It is my pleasure now to bring you my interview with Dr. Maria Moranga. Maria, it's so good to see you again. It's been a little while since we saw each other at our Council of Dental of Membership at the ADA, and you were such a great chair during that time. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. So Like I always do, I'd really like to have you start by telling us a little bit of your story. Like, how did you get into dentistry in the first place? Where have you gone with your profession and where you are today? Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to our channel. And also, don't forget to hit the bell so you never miss out on a single episode. Thanks so much. So I was always good at art, painting and sculpting, acrylic art, not um, oil medium. And then my parents said, you know, you really seem to be good and excelling in science. I was very quiet in school, so I really didn't um, have a lot of uh, ability to go and, you know, ask friends and and do things. Oh, you know, what are you doing and what are you liking, you know, in terms of coursework. So two of my older cousins had graduated college and gone to dental school and then uh, was doing residency. So I would like follow them around and see what was going on when I was then in college. And I really seem to feel that dentistry was a good fit for me. Medicine seemed to be, as a female, way more uh, dedicated in terms of time and ability to have a a dual aspect of being a future mom, perhaps, and also being a, a healthcare professional. And I didn't feel like nursing was going to satisfy my inquisitive mind, and I thought, um, that dentistry really fit a lot of different aspects of being my own boss and yet really contributing in the healthcare profession. So when I really narrowed that con of uh, decisions down, I saw dentistry kept, you know, coming to the foreground, I mean, from, uh, from the background to the foreground. And I really enjoyed it then. And then I applied. And then every time I went on an interview, you know, went to schools and see, you know, the day-to-day activity, I said, yeah, this is where I really would like to be. So... Fast forward, then I became an endodontist. I was supposed to be a pediatrist because the cousin that I had mirrored so often had had a large pediatric practice for me to follow. But then when I did a GPR at a VA hospital, there weren't any children there. So they sent us to like an offsite, you know, hospital affiliation. And I realized that I didn't like children and I didn't like their parents. <laughs> and um, I'm with you on that one. I'm totally with you. And Adana Care seemed to fit my personality and having the most control. 90% of success is in my fingertips and 10% is whether a general dentist could put a good post and crown on it. And I really didn't enjoy pedo anymore, even though I got the pedo award at graduation and everyone said, oh, you're going to go in your cousin's practice. So the day that I had to tell him that I wanted to do something else, I was really, really scared because he had been, you know, uh, I was shadowing him forever and he was mentoring me. But he said, you have to be your own person. And I really felt that that's what I was drawn to. And then being in the VA system, you could go from a class one to an implant all in the same day. So I got really good at endodontic care. And the, you know, average age of the population of people who are in the VA hospital is really much older. So I got to do a lot of calcified cases as opposed to other friends who were in other, you know, public hospitals in the city. And so 
that seemed like the most logical thing. And that's what I did. And I loved every minute of it. So I was really happy to have uh, chosen that instead of what you know, I was uh, being geared for, you know, for so many years. Exactly. So did you do a private practice for a long time or did you go right into your residency? Pro no, you know? Yeah, I did my GPR. And then from there I applied to endo. So because I was in a GPR at a VA hospital, uh, there's one position at the Manhattan VA, they, and Manhattan VA and they said, okay, well, you would have to wait a year to apply because I missed, I had missed the cutoff for that. So then I was like, all right, I'll work for a year. But then NYU had called and said, we have somebody that dropped out. So I called my dad and I said, I need $10,000 in two days. Is that possible? You know, but to save. so he said, well, to save a year of your life was actually good because the VA residents took lecture with us. The only difference is the population of patients they saw were different. They only got to see, uh, you know, veterans and we saw a different population of people at, at NYU in the dental school. So it was basically the same program. One, you were getting paid and the other one, we were paying the school. So, but saving that one year of my life was actually very important to who I am now. So it was a good decision to go and not wait another year. And then did you go after your endo program? Did you go right into private practice or? Well, okay. So I graduated my endo program, got married, got pregnant, graduate all like in the same year. So it was, so I got married in December of my second year, I got pregnant in February and then graduated that June. And no one would hire me because I was female with a big belly. And so everybody said, oh, come back afterwards. Oh, you're going to want to have more than one kid now. And I was like, no, I have loans. I got to like start working. So finally somebody hired me and I was there for like a little bit more than a year. And then I answered a blind ad to a group that was in Brooklyn, very close to my parents' house. So here I am coming back again. And I stayed there for like three years. And then finally I, I said, you know, I've got to do something else. If you're not making any more partners, I, I need to know and, and different like that. So I answered another ad and uh, I went someplace else for a while that was promising a partnership, which didn't turn out well. And then I had a second baby and then I fuddled around again. Meanwhile, I had already started teaching at uh, Stony Brook at the dental school for many years at that point. And then I came across an opportunity from our chair at Stony Brook. He had said, if I wanted to meet somebody, because I went into his office one day and I said, I'm still a nobody. I'm tired of being a nobody. I want to own my own practice. And he goes, it's going to change your life. Some for the good and some not for the, it's not so good. So he introduced me to someone who was looking to retire actually to up by you guys in New Hampshire. And we connected and, you know, I'm there 22 years now. So I spent the first like 10 years, you know, in different practice situations. I even did some DSO model things on Saturday to make extra money, you know, for during the week. And, um, but private practice was, was really good. It's really nice to put your own imprint on everything from the wallpaper in the waiting room to having a hook in the operatory for a patient's pocketbook. You know, I mean, all those other little touches, you know, that, you know, you can bring that, you know, somebody else might not have thought of before. So true. So true. So do you commute up to New Hampshire? No, no, no. That's where the person I bought the practice where he retired to. He was retiring very quickly. His wife was purchasing a bread and, bre uh, bed and breakfast and he had to move really quickly. So he was in New York and he moved yeah. to New Hampshire. Got it. He took half the amount of money, what he was wanted the practice for, because he said that he never wants, someone else had offered him double the amount. And he said he wanted to find the right person to take over. Now, meanwhile, he was leaving the state. He didn't really have to do that. He said he never wanted to meet somebody at a future dental meeting, say, oh, thanks for leaving us with, with that one, you know? So he waited and he saw that I was going to fit in in a different way, but with the same treatment philosophy of compassion and caring that he did. And he took half the amount that he was asking for just to, you know, make sure that I would take it because that's what I could afford at the time. So that's a pretty amazing story. I'll, I'll tell you, because you don't hear that very often. And then after that, University of Connecticut, UConn always had an endodontic symposium. And we met for the next 12 years, every like October when they had it like that to catch up. And um, he was 55 when he left Long Island, but he felt that he was really young. And so he ended up, he himself answered a blind ad and he worked for somebody in New Hampshire and, uh, you know, locally as well, you know. 
So um, everything worked out. It all worked out. That's amazing. Yeah, we learned from each other, even so we were so far away, you know, it was really good. Well, the endodontic community is a very small community. I know that from Bob Amato, who I'm sure you must know because of his leadership roles at AAE. Mm -hmm. You know, he has said it's a very small, tight-knit community of, of endodontists all across the country, which is, I think is fabulous. You know, I think that's a wonderful thing to do. Now, you know, let's talk a little bit more about the practice transition because you had a great transition. I did not have such a great transition. And, you know, what makes the difference between a good transition and a bad transition? You know, I'll just give you a little background on mine. The day after we signed the paperwork, we signed the paperwork on a Tuesday of Labor Day weekend. And that Wednesday, he sent in painters to paint the entire office. A letter went out on my behalf that I did not write that he sent to all of the patients and he missed like 70% of the patients. So patients would come in and they had no idea I was leaving. So, you know, the recommendation that I would have to share with any young women that are going through that is to make sure that you are very methodical about buying a practice and making sure that you pay attention to all of the details because you don't want to change anything in the first year. That's my rule of thumb. I don't know. How do you feel about that? Well, I had 20 year old wallpaper that was chipping bright orange chairs that looked like they were from like early seventies, terrible carpeting and macrame with lots of cobwebs. <laughs> so I was like, so when my husband went in, he goes, we got to trash this place, right? And I was like, all right, I guess so. So somebody had said later on, when they came in, they go, oh, you took down the macrame? And I was like, it was like a beehive of like just bugs. It was like just so gross. So it's kind of funny because people didn't like change right away, just what you said. And then even when I wanted to incorporate a microscope, because I was microscope trained, and here I was going backwards. Um, I had to put in real suction and a compressor. He used to have Sears compressors in the basement for his suction that he ran some kind of funky way. So you would only be able to use the suction every like 15 minutes and he would like take two by twos. It was like kind of messy, but I guess they were okay that I was doing some improvements, but because they really loved him and his personality and he lived close to the town where the office was, they didn't want to hear about that you know, something was not right, you know? So I tried to do that slow. And what I did do, he had told me that he would do me this favor and it actually worked out. Before he left, he raised the price a hundred dollars. He hadn't raised the price in like five years. So at that time, the molar fee was only $500 when everybody else was already eight and eight fifty. So he raised it to six, which was good. So that it looked like that he had done it you know what I'm saying? Instead of like, so, so that was actually a, a pretty big help. So when I came in and said, I go, no, Mark's had that for at least a year. That's what I would, you know, I would say, you know, but those are some subtle differences and it's just it was difficult. People asked me all the time if I was going to have another baby, what my commitment was, you know, um, how's my husband feel about my working late? You know, people had lots of nosy questions, you know, all the time. Was it patients or was it other docs? Both, both. One time I would make patients wear the store board, really hard plastic, you know, glasses. Now I have like a different company that I would just buy at Home Depot. They're like $10 each. And, you know, occasionally they would get stretched out, you know, on the side, you'd have to buy new ones. So someone didn't like the fee. He said that he wanted to pay what he paid nine years previously. So I said, but is the price of a Volvo where you work, where you're a salesperson, the same price? He goes, no. So anyway, he took two pairs of the glasses. So when I spoke to the dentist about it, I said, is he odd like this too? And right away I got, oh, you can't handle the tough cases. Like you can't handle like the tough people. So I learned not to do that. And then I did it a second time when somebody was stretching and doing this whole big uh, and grabbed the bottom of my tush. I actually punched the patient in the arm, called the dentist and he goes, he goes, all right, this is like the second time you've complained about male patients. Like, is it something that you're doing? And I was like, that, nope, not that. that was the last time I would, I would comment about anything that went on in the practice. But they were pretty 
aggressive times. I don't think that, you know, females in general have the same time now, you know, because this in every aspect of educational, you know, systems or whatever, or jobs, there are more females. But back then it was, it was pretty difficult at, at different times to, you know, move forward and not like just want to go home and cry and go, here's the keys, let me go back home. And, well, you know, you, you were a female in a male dominated world, especially in endodontics. I'm certain there weren't that many endodontics that were female at that time. So you were a lone star there and you had to put up with all the shenanigans. But quite honestly, I still think, you know, even with all the education we've done with the population, there are still some young women that get taken advantage of. And I think that, you know, it's not happening so much with their generation or like our son's generation or daughter's generation, but it is still happening with some of our colleagues and our age group where they're still getting proposals from patients or, you know, obnoxious comments or dirty jokes that, you know, it's all inappropriate. You know, it, it, there's a place and a time for all that stuff and it's not in a professional location for sure. Especially when I'm holding a very large needle. Exactly. And I would say to somebody, you know, I could give you the short needle or the long one right now, you know. <laughs> and they're like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was only, you know. No, you, you were pretty serious about it, you know. Well, and you know what? That's good. So any guidance and things that you've learned along the way that you can share with our younger audience about how you've managed some of these difficult men? I mean, I'm assuming they're all men. Women would never approach, not too many women would approach it. I would think not to be too chummy chummy, you know, exactly what you said about, you know, staying professional and not answering or giving light to those questions. If you come back into the room and a patient's not numb yet and they're saying something else, go, all right, I'll be back another minute to check to see if you're still numb. Don't start engaging or being argumentative because right away that decreases your likability, it decreases your credibility, even though you have good hands to do the procedure, you're not going to get far either with that patient or people that that person knows. And, you know, small town dentistry, sometimes it just takes, you know, people from the post office to be. So that's not a, it's not a good thing. So just always maintain and don't offer to like plenty of times, like I would go to like events, but I would always bring then, you know, my husband or my children with me to like an event so that I wasn't there. So it didn't look like that. I was oh, targeting whatever. I would never wear shorts to like any of the events, even if it was like the strawberry festivals, which are like in the second week of June and it's hot outside already in New York. I would make sure I would always, you know, be fully, you know, no skin showing at all, just so that people knew that this is me and this is still me, you know, and not uh, something else. But, uh, you know, and I see it sometimes at graduation or, or um, not graduation ceremonies, but residency graduations. And, you know, maybe young women are not wearing what I'm thinking, you know, should be worn as graduation attire. And I'm like, you know, we've done all the tough work. You have it easier now. Don't push us back a couple of years, you know. You have to still, you know, we're not at a dance party right now. We're at your residency graduation party. Please be, you know, respectful of what that means. And professional, professional yeah. attire. Exactly. Yeah. Would you wear that to work? I mean, that's the question they should be asking themselves. Would you wear that to work? If the answer is no, the only place I would wear this is a, a nightclub, then you've got your answer. Then that's the answer. Exactly. Absolutely. Now, are you still in your private practice? Yes, I am. Okay. And you do you manage your residency also at the same time? I teach at three GPRs and one postgraduate program in addition to private practice. Wow. Yeah. So I'm looking to really like transition. I've had some offers and kind of like the same way that, you know, you're trying to like date somebody like the first gentleman was with me and when he was leaving and we'll see, but now, you know, the pandemic has happened and who knows what kind of value any practice is going to have at any, any moment right now. But that's where I see myself. My happiest days, even though my teaching days are like the longest day, I leave at 530 and I get home at 10 o'clock at night because I go to two uh, hospitals in the same day. I travel from one to the second. You know, it's the lowest income day, but it's the most exhilarating day to really impart. So I go from a GPR to my postgrad later on from like one to 8 p.m., 8.15, I get out. And that's like my most exciting day. 
because I'm teaching GPR residents what they don't know yet and trying to give them, you know, skills so that they can make decisions. Am I able to do this tooth? Am I not able to do this tooth? And then later on, it's a different thing. You're still in teaching mode, but it's almost like you're treating them as colleagues and you want to give them as many pearls as possible because they're almost going to be your colleagues as, as specialists, you know? So it's kind of, both things are different and I lecture both, you know, and I, uh, I bake goods to make sure they get to lecture on time at 7.30, so. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it takes, Maria, whatever it takes. It's a very long day on that Wednesday when I, you know, teach all day. Yeah. But um, I, I enjoyed it a lot. So I could see myself transitioning into that, you know, full time. I used to teach confirmation religion too. And it was, I would get home like really late and I have, would have to like run there. But that was always, even though that was a very long day, when I came home, I was like, oh, I really accomplished something really good today. Right. And spending time mentoring and even sharing wisdom with young people is absolutely worth your time. Now, you're, you've developed a mentoring program also, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. So about 10 years ago, another woman who is older than me approached me and said that she wanted to make a, a lecture series, you know, for women by women. And so we wrestled with the idea, should it be just one presentation or 100 people looking forward? And she said, no. She goes, because just think about it. How many times have you wanted to raise your hand, but you're in a room with a bunch of you know, other male colleagues and you're not thinking, well, is this a dumb question? Is this that? So we made it round tables. This way then nobody ever has to feel uncomfortable of uh, being the lone person. Can you explain that again or I don't get it? So at a small intimate setting of a round table, you'd be more accustomed to ask the speaker who's sitting down with you, oh, could you explain that? Oh, I don't understand this handout, that kind of a thing. So women sign up for three presentations. So they rotate among the tables. And it's it's really women. The idea was to promote women, other specialists and other general dentists who have other skills that maybe other you know females need so that they would use them. You know, there was no reason why we couldn't refer to other you know, women, but so many of us didn't even know that they existed. You know, so we got, you know, different names and we would call and there was so many times people go, oh, I can never do something like that. I go, but it's not like I'm asking you to do it at a plat raised platform. Just come and see. Why don't you come? I'll cop your registration this year so you can see what it's like. And then if you think you can do it next year, maybe we can have you as a speaker. And there's never a time where somebody has not said, oh, I want to do it again. They've always wanted to come back. And that's just really how the whole thing is. Now we've expanded it. In the middle of it, we have our raffles. We have um, sites like, you know, raffles, you know, that they have with a ticket, raffles. So like, we'll do like a veterans raffle. When there was um, uh, Hurricane Maria, we gave the money to the ADA Foundation, you know, so different things, you know, we've had the raffles for. We did a raffle for AAWD because they were having a you know, fundraiser. So every year it's a different, it's a different cause, whether it's dental kind of like medical, we try to, you know, keep it that way. And then this year we added a fashion show from um, Crest, Oral B, and that was good. And that woman, she has been at a diff, you know, couple of different meetings and she, you know, had a booth and everything. So she gave back to us. And then she, as her, her contribution for a raffle gift, she had a lot of different, you know, electric uh, toothbrush things and stuff. So it was good. So what we do is we have, because we have a close affiliation with the dental school at Stony Brook, we asked the dean if we could like have some support. So she normally sends five students come. I pay for a couple of students, whatever the overflow. So if there's one or two students like the last minute that wants to come, we find someone to sponsor their, you know, registration. And this way they can see us in action. And that's really what we want them to see. We want to see young people, my endo residents, my GPR residents, who I still invite back. And now they come and bring other people that they know in practices that they're affiliated with now. So it's really grown in 10 years now that we're doing it. And it's called Scrubs and Stilettos. I love the name. I love it. I think it's awesome. Originally, we were going to call it Scrubs by Day, Stilettos by Night, and Breastfeeding at 2 a.m., but it didn't fit on the flyer. So we, we kept it to SNS instead. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, you know, I want to now, like, switch gears a little bit and get into some specific. Tell me, you know, is there one single best piece of advice you've ever gotten in the field of dentistry? And what was it and who gave it to you? 
Uh, all right. I'm going to say two different people. Oh. One, my very good friend, Terrell Proper. She had been a past president of AAE and its current president of the Tennessee Dental Association. She had broken, you know, the glass ceilings, as, as they call it, in a lot of different arenas, both in ADA and in AAE. And she was like, sometimes you just don't have to say a word just so they see you in the room, which means that you always have to attend something. You don't have to be someone at the microphone. You don't have to be just so that people see you is enough of a presence. And that's what makes the statement. Oh, because sometimes people, I think, just want to overcompensate or be heard. So they want to like then, and that could be often looked at as, oh, she's rude or look, she's doing this. So just to be there that you have participated, even if it's just shaking your head or standing and that's, you already heard. And I felt that was really, you know, powerful. And then my second, my good friend who passed away, Dr. Mark Bauman, he was just a magnificent uh, mentor and confidant for me personally. He really took me from levels from local membership and said, I think you could do this. Or he started, do you think you want to do this? Maybe I should nominate you for this. And before you know it, he just had the way of the confidence that it might not have had. He had a little push. Let, let's just test that one. Let's like see. And he would be like a nice grandfather of just so proud. Oh, I'm so glad you got this award, you know? So I owe so much to him in his memory. You know what? I couldn't agree more. He's such, he was such a wonderful, wonderful man. And uh, he mentored lots of women in New York and, and outside of New York as well. He just had a flair for realizing that women needed to make the mark. Someone needed, someone needed to nominate them. And he was willing not to take the chance, but realize that we are equal. And he was willing to make the push. And support that. Exactly. So do you think that he's the one person that helped you the most during your career? I would say yes. Oh, that's really exciting. I love to hear stories like that because I was speaking to Kathy O a little bit too, and, and she was saying there's two men in her life that really guided her entire career. And she couldn't be more thankful because, you know, most men in our generation or older and maybe 10 years older than us, they're somewhat threatened by women and it's too bad because we're here to just contribute and help. And, and yeah, that's all we wanted to do. It's not competition. And I think a lot of uh, dental leaders always saw, Oh, the, I would hear this and maybe you heard this locally or whatever nationally either. Oh, they're taking away a position. No, we're not. We're contributing just like that's the right word contributed. We're not taking away anything. And Mark was keen enough to just know all of that. And one time I was either at an ABA meeting or an AAE meeting, and my husband had taken my daughter up to do soccer near where he was. And all of a sudden I'm at my meeting and I see pictures of my daughter in the field. And I was like, but they're not from my husband. They're from Mark. He and his wife went there with, they were babysitting uh, uh, their son's dog. And they took the dog to the field and they made it across to where she was playing soccer. And he just said he wanted to be there and to like be, that I was there, you know, and he really made me feel like that I was there, that I wasn't missing everything, you know, because so many times I feel that, you know, you missed this. And I remember my son's like, you missed my winter rehearsal one year. And I was like, I know, I know, but we were having legislative night and we were trying to get, you know, a certain thing put together for a bill. So, so many times there's a lot of regret and sacrifice, but I think my children have come to see that the strength that I had early on they've incorporated a lot of components. And so um, I never really turned back. You know, sometimes there would be women in the neighborhood whose daughters were applying for college and had to write an essay or a personal statement. And when they asked me instead of their mom, or their mom suggested, you know, what could you, why don't you go show Maria the essay, see what she thinks of it. That kind of validated that, hey, I could contribute on all different fronts, you know, and that was a, a really special recognition, you know. And it's, it's wonderful. I, I don't have any regrets in that fold. I want to go back to the leadership piece, but just because you just brought up, you know, neighborhoods and kids and stuff, you know, how did you find balancing um, children and a career and a practice and all of that when you were going through it? I have the most wonderful husband. And I tell that to dental students when they say, 
when they say, uh, how do you do it all? I go, you have to find the right person who doesn't feel threatened, who can pitch into all the other things. Food shopping, this is even more organized than you are. And that's what I have. And it's like unbelievable. He's been my dental assistant in the last three weekends of the pandemic now on Saturdays. How fabulous is that? And he cleans that operatory so well, it's like unbelievable in between patients. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome. So like another question I get, which is funny from residents who are like going out or whatever, Dr. Moringa, when do you think I should have a baby? And I'm like, don't you think you should be asking your husband that question? When do you think you should have the baby? So they'll give me all kinds of things. Well, he still wraps the, uh, the tea string and leaves it on the counter. How's he going having a baby i can't be i gotta be there i gotta make the money and all this other so it's like kind of like funny it's like oh boy here comes all here comes the stuff yeah 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 so the balance not that everything is always rosy because it never is you know and i have a very strong personality that i can i could start here screaming and then i have to be brought back to reality as most of us do but his way of calming all right uh tell me when you feel better i'll be back then you know like that kind of a thing you know that's perfect or I'll call my sister and she'll go, Ed is right, you know. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, of course he is, you know. So much so that my dental colleagues call him St. Ed because it's true. Yeah. And, you know, I had wonderful parents who don't live or live an hour from me. But if there was ever a babysitting issue. They were always my backup. So if I tell, you know, young women who are planning to have a family, have a backup to your backup. You may have to go to that second, that second thing because... If you are working for somebody, they don't care that you have, you know, they're not going to throw you good, good cases then afterwards. You know, you've got to make sure that you're there. There were several times I had brought my son in the baby carrier to the dental office when he was maybe between three and six months old and then had that babysitter meet me there. A couple of times my parents came from Brooklyn and drove to pick up my son, take him back to Brooklyn, and then I drove after it. It's a lot of driving. I was in a car a lot of times, you know? So then I started to try to, yeah, I try to like rearrange, you know, my schedule where I would sleep over then if I was my parents' house so that it would be closer to the next day's job. You know, lots of juggling. I remember it well, um, and I don't think it's something you could ever really plan for. It just has to happen like this, and whatever parameters you have, sometimes you cross over them and and just have to deal with it that way. There is no playbook. It's kind of like this pandemic. There is no playbook right now. I totally agree with you 100%. And I think that just planning and strategizing with other women as to how to manage and balance it is critically important. You cannot do it all by yourself. I must say that my daughter was five when I started dental school and she was nine by the time I graduated. And so right away, you know, she was at my office every day after school and she learned how to answer the phone and dental assist, not that she liked it very much, but, you know, because she had to, you know, I, I didn't have a choice. I, you know, my husband was out at working and, you know, I lived and worked in the same town. She had to come to my office after school because I wasn't letting her go home by herself. So I really think um, years ago, I know that when I was a student, well, maybe not when I was a student. I think years later, I had heard about AAWD, and I really didn't really join to become active at all until maybe, like, I'm going to say, like, four years ago. And I really think if that, you know, forum is pushed, I don't want to say the word push, but brought out, you know, to young women earlier on, because there are dental school chapters, but there were dues as well. So then, you know, a, a student may say, okay, uh, we already pay X for tuition now, we have to pay dues, but there are a lot of other ways of trying to, you know, incorporate that into something. I wish I had had that when I was younger, you know, an AAWD chapter in my, in my school, you know, to have some mentoring. I was doing it at Columbia. And then recently the new school in New York Toro, we had a cancel because it was, it was, it was going to be held in April. So instead we're going to do one of these, we're going to do a Zoom because there had been 35 women that had signed up for them, wanted to know, these questions, and so many times I'm thinking that when they get me as a speaker, I'm going to speak about endodontics, but that's about five minutes. The rest is all this other stuff. But that other stuff is what is part of us, and we have to be available to give it because where are they going to get it from? And only going to be able to get it from people that have already experienced it. And as many times as, you know, I would say, oh, this is not right. This is, 
Yeah, because but we have to be you know. And so, you know, students from all over know that two AM is the time when my husband says no more phone calls or texting. You know, you know, right now I'm trying to work with a, a young girl that's uh, from New Penn and she's an ASDA, you know, leader. And she doesn't want to do a GPR. She'd rather go right into an endonic program. So I had introduced her because she really lives in California. You know, uh, her family lives there to some people in California. And they were like, you know, you should really listen to her. You really should do a GPR. You know, follow. Dr. Moringa knows this kind of stuff. You know, you should really do it the way she wants to. So I made all the pathways. Now she has to decide which way she wants to do. But I'm always available to read their personal statements and then try to, you know, tweak something and that's it. But I do it from some, from, you know, male students too. I've done it for several male students as well. I think females gravitate more to me because they, you know, they want to, you know, they want to see me and I'm mama Moringa to so many of them and that's okay with me. You know? so. Absolutely. You know, let's go back now to your leadership roles. Can you walk me through some of the leadership roles and, and what allowed you to keep taking new roles on is was there you know just you know confidence building was it you know that just more people supporting you along the way what do you think made the difference well i think the first one was when i became i replaced uh, an outgoing chair at the local level for membership and he said we need a woman to do this he goes i think you should do it and i was like i don't want to go drive to albany and do that that sounds scary and that's where I went, met Mark, Mark Bauman. He was a uh, Cal. He was already at the eight. I think Billy. I believe he was already like in his first year of his four year, you know, term. And um, you know, he was going around the room, and we were like talking about different things and stuff. And he's like, "Well, we have a new person right here. Why don't we make her in charge of something?" And I'm like, "Do they have to pick on the new person like right now?" So it was kind of like funny because he just like went right in zoom and then like at the break he was he was saying something like um i think you can do it you know there's plenty of people here i go all right i guess but then once you start doing it all of a sudden it, it, it's a snowball and then it starts and before you know it the snowball encompasses other people and people want to join you and then people want to support you just like you said but you have to really have built some level of confidence because it's so easy to be pushed down and, and all of a sudden have Catholic school guilt and said, I can't do this. I wasn't meant to do this, but you are. It's just that I could be there for you on the times when you don't feel like you have the confidence. And that's what a good mentor I feel is, you know, there's so many quotes and great stories about leadership, but my favorite one is from Michael Jordan. It's that you must earn your leadership every day. And I think mentoring in that goes hand in hand because Membership, as you know, is not, is a daily thing. There's always someone that's complaining and we just don't know why they don't want to renew. We just don't know what they are grabbing from us. And there's always a story with it. And you have to be that person, that empathetic ear. Hey, tell me why. Let me hear it. And that's like just a wonderful thing that I feel that I'm cut out to make those connections and, and feel... They may not at the end of the phone call a week later, if I call them back, still want to rejoin or something. But I know that I've made an impression that for something else, they'll, you know, they'll, they may contact me. And then that might turn into something. So you always have to be more optimistic. Um, no is never a no. Right. But um, it could be always a maybe. So you went from local to state and then to ADA? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then somewhere in the middle of that, while I was doing my uh, New York State term as, as chair, decided to apply to diversity and leadership, you know, program at the ADA. And that was really good. I took some very big hits on confidence and ability. I thought I knew it all. You know, the ADA, you know, gives you like seed money to start a project in your local community. And mine was going to be for the identification since we're dentists, uh, the HPV, you know, virus and oral pharyngeal cancer. So I made a middle school and high school educational program. Well, I was booed off the stage at the local, you know, PTA. My flyers were ripped up. My easel was pushed down. And I remember telling Joe Martin at the ADA, I can't ever go back. And he goes, you'll find a way to recreate yourself. And that's what I did. So I started with a small team, a couple of people, gave three head and neck exams to the police department, 
to uh, different uh, church groups, different things, so they wouldn't see it was so scary. And then I came back and I altered that scary presentation. And then they finally accepted it because, you know, parents and, you know, we like to think that children aren't engaging in sexual activity behavior that can lead to, you know, these other diseases and, and cancers, but they are. So our little bit of information needs to be out there. And if we have it, um, so I had to recreate myself, but it was fine. I finally got it going, the program, and um, it was good. But it was scary. And I remember I'm, I'm not going to have enough time to get this in time for the ADA. But, you know, it was an ongoing you know, program, even past the time when I was, you know, no longer at that. But then I got to be on the ADA as a committee person for diversity and leadership, which was, I felt really, really good about that. And, you know, none of this really would have evolved. If it wasn't probably for New York State mandating many, many years ago, the having the amalgam separator device, and I had told someone that was involved in AAE, you know, how come prosthodontists don't have to or don't have to use it? You know, because the definition of what type of dentistry they use by some old-fashioned standard didn't necessitate that they have it. So the person said, "Well, if you don't like it, you should join something with AAE." And I was like, "All right, what's open and what's available?" So then I kind of made that path myself because I was angry about this amalgam separator issue. And that's how I really got into AAE, some different things about that. And so, so I carry a couple of hats. Absolutely, you carry a couple of hats. Now, leadership-wise, you just recently were going to do the vice presidency for the ADA, correct? Correct. And then you step away from that. I don't know what the story is behind that, but I think you're going for it again this year. Is that correct? Yes. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about that role. Well, the vice president's role, whether it be the first or second, really represents the house, meaning all the delegates and the alternate delegates. And I feel being such a hands-on people person uh, and talking with people from all these connections that I've had from other leadership roles, that I really feel that I know more about the house than what the board level has to do because that's made up of the trustees and the uh, president like who ascends to the presidency is really a former uh, board person you know a, a, a trustee and i felt that vice president really fit my my passion for being a membership advocate for so many years in different in different things and I've gone to membership things. I've gone to Carrie Ron, Ronnie's event so many times in California and spoken at her event. North Carolina, I was at a women's event. I go and try to, and if I'm not asked to speak, I go and attend. Like uh, Florida had had one recently last year that Jolene had put together. It was the first one that, that they did. And I said, I would like to be invited. You know, just to, you know, just send me an invitation. What do you want to do down here? So I incorporated it with going to see friends of mine in Naples, a retired dentist. So I dragged her to the drive, but it was like almost two hours to get from where she was to, to that. But we didn't mind. It was the whole thing of just supporting other people. Like we didn't, I didn't have to be a Floridian to go. There were, you know, different topics and different speakers, but it was just in that normal year, you know what? It was great to have other people come. And Jolene felt really happy that I was able, you know, to make it. But that's why I feel that I am, you know, that's the voice of, our membership of the delegates, and that's what the house is, and that's what really the that VP position is um, is for, is to represent those people that are sitting behind the stage. So, well, we're happy to support you in any way we can. It would be great to see another female up on that deck. Oh, so. thank you. Absolutely. So, tell us one obstacle that you have overcome that you're most proud of in your life. Ha ha. So. I stuttered terribly from like age nine. Yeah, uh, my brother had died as an infant and I was almost three at the time. And my mom said I would go into his room and shake the crib and say, where's baby brother, where's baby brother? And then after he passed, I didn't speak for many, many months. And finally, when I did speak, I, I stuttered terribly. Mm. So much so that, uh, you know, my parents took me to, pediatrician and then to a speech pathologist and they all said it was something that from traumatic that I would outgrow um but on first Friday mass in in Catholic school and on Fridays 
you know, you had to be at some point um, doing one of the readings. And I was stuck on the word, this is a letter from St. Paul to the Thessalonians. I must have said the tutus, the tutus, like five different times. Before you know it, all the classes, um, grades, you know, one through eight were laughing. And one of the nuns had to come and take me off the lectern and join me. I didn't go to school for like two days because I was so embarrassed and I made up that I had belly aches because I studied so terribly. And then I was good at gymnastics and ballet. And then I wanted to maybe be a cheerleader because those were some, you know, skills that I had. But I couldn't get over the speech part, you know, because you had to be confident and really speak and, and, and project your voice. And so I just really wanted it so much that I overcame it. it. Like it took some months, but it was something. When I tell people now that I used to study, they go, how could it be? You never shut up. But it's something that I really had to work on because I really wanted that cheerleading position. You know, there's sometimes though, if I get super nervous, I'll, but, 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 but I'll, I'll, I'll see my, myself uh, just about going into a tongue tie and uh, start stuttering. But that was traumatic because it was really, um, that was a good part of my adolescence, you know, till age 16. Congratulations. That's not easy to overcome. Not easy at all. So confidence wise, do you feel like you were always confident or do you think that there were times in your life where you weren't and you developed it over time? And if so, how did you develop your confidence? I think not many people are born with a large degree of confidence. Mm, I agree with you. Yeah. I think confidence is a real trial and error type of situation. You try something, you see if it works. If somebody pats you on the back, you'll go, okay like a Pavlov go, you go, all right, I'll repeat this action. So I don't think it's really something, I think that, you know, by when you're being repetitive and somebody says, oh, that was a good thing. And then, you know, oh, okay. I, that was, that was a great thing. A couple of times when I had taught confirmation religion, go back to that, there was a male student and on his graduation, because he was in the same year as my daughter said, oh, I never really you know, worried about or concerned myself with religion until I had you as a religion teacher. And I was like, how could it be? You were terrible in class. And he goes, no, you made me think of a lot of things. And I'm sorry if I aggravated you back then. So that's seventh grade. So we're talking now he's 12th grader. So that's a significant amount of years later. And it just made me feel like so proud that, you know, all that aggravation was actually, you know, worth it. I did impart something to, you know, someone else. And then in turn, that gives you confidence to do it again, to go outside of the comfort and go, you know what? Now I'm going to make sure five people are going to do it this way, you know? So that kind of is how really confidence starts to, you know, develop. And, you know, it's difficult for women, I think, to say, you know, to each other, to applaud each other. And we don't do that enough. You know, there's still a lot of jealousy among us. And it's so sad because... We need to be like the net for all of us when we fall. I totally agree with you. It's difficult when we don't do that for each other. You know, I would like for it to be, you know, and I think that's why organizations that have, uh, you know, women centered, you know, groups are really good because uh, we could be ourselves. We don't have to be, you know, putting on a show. They can see us with our hair down and, and, you know, no white makeup and you know, just as good as anything, you know? So, mm -hmm. I think that's really important too. And that from there, confidence, just all of a sudden, you know, you feel it, you know, you feel you could go out onto that stage and give a speech. I do believe it's one step at a time. I really do. I think it's only taking action, developing consistent action and just moving one step at a time forward that you, you start to develop it. Absolutely. And I think you're absolutely right that many young women are, are not inherently confident in their ability and they're always second guessing themselves. And, you know, unfortunately that, that worthiness syndrome, you know, we just don't feel like we're worthy of anything. And it's, it's a little bit on the sad side. Is there anybody in dentistry who inspires you today? Uh, that still inspires me. Well, mm. it was funny. I had this conversation with some friends that also know Dr. Bauman. And they said so many times if they're doing a recipe or they're cooking something, they would like to take a picture and show him. Because so many times if I was in a restaurant, I would just go, what do you think of this? And then he'll Google where I am. Like, and he'll be like, oh, this is how they're making it. And I was like, so we were like talking about that. But 
I said to somebody recently, well, just text him. His phone is okay. I just like text him like to complain. Could you believe this happened to us today? Like expecting him to like answer, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think he's still with and, and watches over us, you know? And I feel comfortable enough to even, you know, say that. I have a very good rapport with his wife. Um, she's a wonderful woman. And um, she had been very ill last year, you know, before. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I want to check in on her and see how she's doing and, and, and different things. Cause I know she misses him terribly, but there's so many of us. And, you know, he had, I don't know if you knew this, he, in his district in Saratoga, he would do a women's cooking event where he was the host of, he was the chef. Wow. And so two years that I went, the last year that I went, which was the year before um, he passed, it was at the pre the local president's house and it was Valentine's day week, like coming up. Everything was like dyed red, beautiful flowers. You couldn't imagine everything was like, just so perfect. Beet pasta, you know, from, um, uh, he made the raviolis into like beautiful pink colors of ribbons. And then he taught all of us how to stuff, uh, cannolis. I mean, you can't just, everything was all, you know, feminine and, there were like so many women and that's just who he was and still is to, you know, so many of us. How wonderful. What great memories, huh? Yeah. 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 And like I said, Tara proper, I think she's my go-to endodontic, you know, mentor person that I, I look to for different, you know, different things. And of course there's, you know, you mentioned before, you know, Kathy O'Loughlin, I mean, really so many things are, how could you not, be a female and say, wow, she's done an amazing job. I mean, everything that she has accomplished and to be in that boardroom with so many different personalities and, you know, have to, her confidence and her ability to communicate with people. That's, that's some, that's just some, some gal. <laughs> that's all I have. Some talent. Yeah. Tell us one thing that, that people would be surprised to know about you. I love gardening. Mm -hmm. I actually like weeding more than gardening. You do? I do. So I bought this card. I don't know how well you can see it. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. Okay. So I'm going to read. Do you see what it says? The garden has been my therapy. Mm hmm Okay. So I'm just going to read it, part of it. Here among the flowers and the bright fruit, I work in the household of nature and refresh my spirit. It seems to me that every weed I pull is a bit of grief I am learning to set aside. A tear I've weeded out so that good cheer can grow again. <gasps> I love that. Ten years old, this card. I've never given it to anyone because I really bought it for myself. And every time I think of that, it's so true because the whole physicality of weeding is that you're going and your strength is pulling. And the idea is to get the whole bottom of the weed so that that doesn't replicate again. And then you got, got to be there five days later, you know, and it just, it's a calming effect on me weeding. I know it's so strange. I've offered to weed other people's, you know, gardens. You can come to me in the mailbox, you know, because that's just, it's just something that I enjoy. Doing. <laughs> but all gardening I like as a whole thing. I bought it a lot in the house we live. I bought it a lot of the nursery shrubs except one tree specimen. So I got to learn the genus names of, of different uh, trees and different things like that. So I could, I could see myself, you know, working there like part-time in this, you know, during seasonal things, helping out. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. I would want to be one of the crews. Like I would be able to say, okay, these are the plants you need, you know, for this plant or whatever, but I'll come and I'll help you do it. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm not going to send somebody. I would be wanting to, wanting to do the digging, you know, do the digging and, yeah, and plant. I like that. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Maybe that's why I'm an endodontist because I like to also dig in canals. Yeah. <laughs> so um, going back to your private practice, did you do any marketing? And if so, you know, what was a successful marketing idea that you had that worked well? Absolutely zero. No marketing. That's awesome. So all word of mouth. Yeah, this is what I used to do. You know, I live in, like I said, I live almost an hour away. But I would use the dry cleaners in that neighborhood. I would do grocery shopping in that neighborhood. Of course, the post office, because I would have to get mail from there. So anything that the banking I would do there, this way I got to make the people 
you know, and I go, hi, this person in town, you know, if you need something, I know that, you know, this particular company you work for, whether it be Home Depot or Horizon, has this insurance, is this something we take if, if you're ever in, you know, in a series and you can't find somebody, you know, you know, let me see if I can help you like that. So I would patronize them. So I would kind of like put myself out there instead of doing or paying a company. I think people know when you're phony. Uh, I totally agree. Yep. So this is a funny story. So many years ago, I'm going to say like five or six years ago, someone ran into the office and said, the bull is loose. And I was like, what does that mean? So there's a bull farm also. There's duck farms. It's a very agricultural area where I am. And so we literally closed up and went to go help, like do like trafficking so that the bulls would like go back to where they were being like, you know, and not even the police department could get these things. That It was like, but we left and people were like, what are you doing out here, doc? You can hurt your hands. I go, I need to help. You know, I put my hair back in a ponytail, put my other sneakers on, we just ran out the door to help. It's, it's just who you are. You know, when you belong to a community, it doesn't matter. You know, so many times I've either picked the patient up or had my assistant drive them home if they were elderly or didn't feel good. And then later on, we made sure their car got back to the house and everything. You know, that we keep hearing this thing of we're in this together, you know, now, you know, like a, this big, this big term. But I've always been in this together. And I really believe that that's how I became successful because people just saw that I was, you know, for them and with them, no matter, you know, no matter what they needed. I think that's a perfect piece of advice is connecting to the community because that's the one organic way that you can get your name out there and you don't have to pay any money for it. It's an awesome way to do it. Absolutely. Um, what's your favorite way to relieve stress? Weeding. Ah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, that's, um, I used to do a lot of boxing actually. Oh, cool. But I really have bad tendonitis and like a hip, a chip in the elbow here. So I try not to do an uppercut anymore. Those punches hurt. Yeah. You be surprised. And I'm talking about kickboxing because that's really, I'm talking about in a ring with a mouthpiece hitting another person, you know, uh, against, you know, like they have a mitt, you know, a flat mitt and you're hitting that mitt. That's a very good stress release. But, you know, the elbow, the uppercuts I can't do, but I'm left-handed. So I have a really good sneaky, you know, Ah, Southpaw. Yeah. Oh, very good. And do you have a personal mantra or motto? Is, was that the weeding, the one, your motto and your, your mantra? Um, I heard last year we went to a, a dentist's son had become a state senator. And it was his second attempt, you know, at doing it. And he finally got the votes. And at his inaugural address, a lot of people and politicians came. And the attorney general of our state came. And she said something so profound. I was like, damn, this is like a good thing. She said, a setback is nothing more than a dress rehearsal for your comeback. Ah, I love it. I took out my phone. I typed that into my notes. And I said to my husband, I'm going to use that. And it's true because I could see so many times when I wanted to take my ball and go home that I had to be talked into, try again. You know, maybe they weren't ready for you yet. Maybe they didn't understand you yet, you know. And sometimes the second time, sometimes it takes a third time. But a setback, and that's how I think you have to look at it. If I think women think, oh, they hate me. They don't hate you. They didn't appreciate it yet. And they didn't understand it yet. So when you come back for the, the main event, that'll be the, that'll be the time to throw the knockout punch. There you go. There you go. That ties it all together. It does. It absolutely does. It absolutely does. Well, it has been a pleasure and I can't thank you enough for all the advice that you provided. It's amazing. It's been a great hour conversation and some great pieces of advice. And I, I can't thank you enough, Maria. Thank you so much for listening to the Women in Dentistry podcast with Dr. MJ Hanlon. If you like our show and want to know more about us, check out our website, thewomenindentistry.com or please leave us a review on iTunes. Join us for our next episode as we bring you another amazing woman leading the way for the next generation.